We're live. Hey, guess what? It's just the Sky Kid. We're at Palace Day, Sheila Reno, and it is the interview portion of the show. We have Minnesota hardcore Northwoods crust band Radical Fun Time. Hi, guys. Hey, how's it going? Hello. So we'll do quick introductions. Your name and what you play. Old Punker. I'm Punk Rock Sam. I play guitar and yell. I'm Jason. I play drums and I also yell. You do. And you both yell differently. So to kick off our interview portion of this show, how did you come up with the name Radical Fun Time and how long have you been a band? Good questions. Um, we're a bunch of radical environmentalist activists, anarchists. We like having a good time while being uh, productive. We're going on seven years. I think uh, April 20th will be seven years since our first show. Awesome. And are you two both original bem members of the band? I am. I, I am not. How long have I been in the band now? He's, he's been four or, five. four or five years. So he's been, he's been he's there for a long haul. Has there been different incarnations of Radical Fun Time? He's the sixth drummer. Wow. Why can't you keep a drummer? They keep dying. Oh, no. Yeah, my best friends have all passed away, it's sad. That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. that, oh, see, so the death conversation outside was kind of on par, huh? Yeah. <coughs> so what made you want to join Radical Fun Time? Uh, How did you come to be in this band? I've known Sam a long time. Uh, we played in uh, other bands together. We played Good Slurry Vision and Good yeah. Morning. and We yeah. met at Winona State University in 2000. At, and I was in a band, he was in a band, and we played at this log cabin in the woods, <laughs> and all these taxidermy animals, and there's Amnesty Internationals there, a bunch of crazy uh, people running around, and we met each other, yeah. and then it kind of, eventually I needed a drummer, and yeah, I fell in love with the, the Wino Punks, and the that, punks I had a great exists. time that night, and it was, from there it was... Yeah, yeah. It just took out from there. History yeah. wrote itself, yes. eh? So then, how, I mean, I, you know, when you first messaged me, Sam, I went through and I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I went through and I read all of your stuff and I was like, I really align with a lot of what these guys believe in. So I was super excited that you wanted to come and then that we got to do this. So talk about the significance of your political ideology um, and philosophies behind this band. Like, what drives you to write your lyrical content, and pretty much what does it pertain to? I think most of our lyrics come from first-hand experiences, like being out there in the trenches, if it's at Standing Rock, or or just, you know, in the city doing things where we're, like, politically active. We're both environmentalists and just socially conscious, and I feel like just the way we live our lives a lot of the lyrics are like, or the drawings as well are like telling the story of, of daily life, of what we just kind of how we live our life actually. It's, I feel like everything goes hand in hand, like the art, the poetry, the lyrics, the, you know, the music. It's all kind of energy with like positive energy that's trying to work towards a, a, a common goal. And what do you want to see change? Um, we got to change the way we're using our energy. Um, we're, we're, lately, now we're against Line 3. We were at Standing Rock, now we're fighting Line 3. We were at Mackawa Camp. Um, that line's going about 10 miles north of where I live. All pipelines link. It's just a matter of time. We need to do renewable energy. It's just, um, we just, I, it's just we need to do a whole radicalization of how we how we use our current resources. Green New Deal. Yeah. Great. Right. And people used fucking the earth before all of this other shit. <laughs> Stop using the fucking dinosaurs, man. They weren't here so that you could light your house That's or true. drive your car, you know? <laughs> they were just here to eat plants and each other. So, um, so that brings me to this question. You actually travel around to these different sites and set up as like activists at these sites, what do you do? Um, sometimes just being there is, is the most important thing. You know, staying together with others that are there. You know, that groups bring issues to 
things and then maybe the newspaper paper will get involved and write an article um I guess we built shelters for people that were there for the long haul before. Um, we've done a lot of benefits. We did, you know, we've been, we played, played at places that raised money. We've had supply runs where people could bring in. We had a list of supplies that, that the camps needed that us or other people were running supplies to. So if you brought it to the show or, you know, brought it to like a major city where this was going on, then it was transported out six hours away to where the camps were. Do you feel that there are other bands out there that have that same sort of political message? Because in its initial construction, punk rock was supposed to be the antithesis of structure, to bring about positive unifying change. It has, of course, a history of other negative things that went along with it, but in its grassroots, that's what initially punk rock was to do. And do you find that there are other bands doing that? Or do you think that you are, you know, the only ones out here? Well, what's that scene like? I mean, the reason why I fell in, punk, fell in love with punk rock was because of the political aspects. At a young age, we'd go to shows and there'd be food not bombs, like serving, serving everyone like vegan veggie meals and there'd be, this time we were dealing with the Iraq war, so we were petitioning the end of sanctions and things like that, you know. <clears throat> so we'd, you know, and then just have speakers come. We'd have speakers come and educate people and, you know, like Ramona Africa from the MOVE organization, like hearing her speak, it was super powerful and just different people. Like a, lot, a lot of the early shows I remember, that we'd have a lot of petitions and pamphlets speakers and just like groups that were there to organize people as well as to play music and that whole scene is what i loved it doesn't have to be that punk rock could just be you know some people don't have any idealism which is you know they you know they dress very fashionable and spike their hair but when it comes to it at the end of the day it, politics aren't always there i like the politics part of punk rock and that part has always kept me going and being around. So how many, is this your main project or are there other things that you guys do? This is our main project right now. We've both been in other bands before, like he went out and lived in Portland for a while and I was gone and then I had the hole and we kind of came back and I feel like this is our main project right now but you know I, I play with other people and you know he does as well and, but as far as my brainchild and most of my energy, it's radical fun time. I'll play bass and do other stuff in bands and kind of sit in, but most of the songwriting and the art and the lyrics is, I spend a lot of, a lot of time on that. Is, yeah, we do have a lot of fun jamming with people too, and we are we kind of got a side thing on the back burner, radical friend time, where it's just like us, you know, recording, like a lot of our most recent recordings are actually like, you know, DIY, like uh, we record, mix, and sometimes mastered ourselves for, for CD. Um, so yeah, we, we're kind of into recording uh, uh, with our friends now. It's a radical friend time. It's kind of the project on the back burner. So That's really look for cool. that soon. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we've, I like playing with a lot of people. If we, at one point in time, we were an eight piece and we were playing mm -hmm. and we, we did a few shows like that in a row. But um, bare bones and be able to travel, I mean, we can fit both of us in a, a car and be able to do it. Once you get the bass player or anyone else, we're either <laughs> taking a large vehicle or right. multiple vehicles. And, and Logistics we, becomes we, we, hard. We play a lot of shows too, so just the gas and everything, it just, it, you know, it makes it easy. Or, How often are you guys playing out? You know, the first couple of years we were averaging about over 100 shows a year. God damn. And now we're, we're a little bit older, and I have a bigger family, so it's it's slowed down. But I feel like we're playing almost every week. We see each other at least two or three times a week. And, you know, if it's not like, you know, usually we practice, usually like a show, and then we're writing all these new songs to record. We're always kind of like recording. We're putting out a lot of comps, too. We've, we're actually working on Punk to the Bone compilation series. We're on uh, working on the fifth one. Cool. I have a couple... Maybe an old one I can give you. Neat. 
Yeah, the Funk of the Bone 4 is just, it's just about to come out. It's got 36 bands from 11 countries on it, and me and Bro L pretty much or orchestrated the whole thing. How did you come up with that, and how did you collect music from all over for that? Um, a lot of bands we play with, you know, we put it on the internet and just kind of had submission guidelines. Um, Jason recorded a couple of the bands, you know, in his studio. And, so, yeah, but I mean, we've been playing, like, I, I mean, when I said we met in 2000, I was playing in a band before that, so it's, you know, over the years, of, we've been... You have so much yeah. music. Like, <laughs> we have a lot of music, a lot of <laughs> lot friends we've played with. How, yeah. how many albums are on Bandcamp? Because I think initially when you first contacted me, there was like 11, <laughs> I think, and there was like so much to choose from to listen to, so... Yeah, I'm not sure. I know if you count the compilations and like the three-way splits and stuff, we're over 35 different right. releases we're on. And like the, like the Punk the Bone, we're talking about that. We're on a couple of those. And so we're almost close to 40 if you count the new stuff we're working on that's coming out soon. When do you? When's the estimated release date for that? Can I ask that? Not to rush you into making it happen. <laughs> Punk the Bone 4 should be coming out at the end of April. Yes. What 11 countries? Can we, I ask that? Yeah, um, Australia, Brazil, Indonesia, United States, U uh, Mexico, Canada. Um, that's all I can think of the top of my head. <laughs> you, you, yeah. That, yeah, that's a good... There's a few. That's, that's a good yeah. smattering. Yeah. Australia. So have you guys played with anybody from not the States? We had played with a band from Australia, I guess. It was kind of different. It was like a live stream. Oh. But it was, yeah. It was, at, it was at a venue with a lot of live bands, and then the, during the set, the Australian band came on, like, you know, through the monitors and on the screen, and there was like a phone call in. So that was, that was a different show. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you guys primarily play out in Minnesota, or do you frequently do tours? Um,. We were doing two major tours the first few years. Um, the last major tour was February 2017. And we went from, you know, all the way to the West Coast and you know, maybe one show in Mexico and then back this way. And I did a couple shows in Canada. But, and then, um, but lately we've been trying to record and I think we got like other personal stuff that's been going on, so we've slowed down a little bit. But you know, we're here tonight. We're playing Chicago tomorrow and Oshkosh the next day. Yep, you're playing with Hijack. Yeah. In Oshkosh. Yeah. Ron Tyrell, who is the drummer on that band, plays in so many other things. And we recorded him like in four different <laughs> sets at Punk Fest cool. last year in Milwaukee. So, how did you set up those two shows? Who are you playing with in Chicago and where tomorrow? We're playing at a house show called Gra uh, Grandma's House, and the bands are S S D, S N D, S N D, yeah, and then, uh, from L A. From L A. They've been around to about nineteen ninety, so they're old school <laughs> band. And then we're playing with a couple local bands. Have you ever heard these local bands before? Or this will be a we're diving into a brand new experience. We're diving into a brand new yeah. experience. The guy that did the show. I've talked to, I've helped with like Milwaukee shows and Minneapolis shows with his bands he's had on tour. And then um, I have a couple of fr friends, I have old bandmates that's gonna be there from Chump Change. And then a couple other people I know, so I'm excited. I've got a photographer coming. Awesome. And then in Oshkosh on Saturday? Yep. And I know it's Hijack, and I can't remember who else. Who else is playing the show? <laughs> Off key? I think. But where is that one gonna be? That's at um Jambalaya. Jambalaya Art Arts Inc. Did That's, you bring art? I should have. <laughs> I, I have some <laughs> art, but I should have brought some <clears throat> paintings. Yeah, your art is very psychedelic. So like it's really f it's fun for me to look at because I'm very much into expanding my mind in such ways. <laughs> but um where does that you know, muse 
who like what is your muse and how do you come up with your art um you know I, the art i'm drawing is really experiences we're having like the new cover of the record i think it's us hanging out in my backyard playing music around the fire with the animals and the, the kids and everybody you know and and a lot of that is like things we do if it's you know you know like the one before it, the end all wars was a lot of pipeline issues that we were talking about before so that was kind of like the standing rock imagery and stuff like that and then you know, a lot of it's just what we do. We rock out at shows, so it's us playing, or it's us skateboarding, or gardening, or, you know, walking through the woods. We're, we're nature, nature-oriented, so there's a lot of... We're nature-centric, too. Yeah. Hemlocks are beautiful. <laughs> and so are waterfalls. We went up north and did a waterfall tour um, in Marionette, and then crossed over into Escanaba, and went to the oldest hemlock forest. And it was like Peninsula Point up in Escanaba, or maybe it's called Sandstone, I think, past that way. But they, Peninsula Point is a historic marker for monarch migration. And in the like late summer, early fall, all of these fucking monarchs flock there before they head to Mexico. So That's cool. Awesome. That'd be beautiful to see. I know. I want to go see it. We were up there just before it was going to happen, and it was dark. Oh, no. <laughs> but it was still something that moves you. If you've never gone outside, go the fuck in the woods. <laughs> you will reconnect with something that is truly, I think, a spiritual experience. It kind of rejuvenates you. I agree. I feel yes. like we've lost touch with ourselves and with nature. and I think like just being out there allows you to be more with yourself mm. you said that you do things locally too now it was probably five years ago i had read a study that was done i think by the university of minnesota and they were studying the frogs in the lakes and that they were finding genetic mutations happening due to pollution are you guys actively involved within minnesota and trying to cure the runoff that is causing that as well or did I just educate you? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I I worked for uh, Clearwater Land and Water Conservation before, so we went out there and we tested water and soil in the lakes where I live. And I've also like you know worked as like a watercraft inspector to Ooh. stop aquatic invasive species from coming into coming into lakes and make sure that it's clean. I live actually four hours north of Jason at the start of the Mississippi River right by Lake Itasca mm. Minnesota's first state park Itasca State Park um and up there everything's still really clean mm -hmm. so our main concern is to keep it that way right and we have a lot it's getting like it's it's encroaching and every year if you get like the fishing manual you can the all the new lakes are contaminated in red ah. so if you flip through that you can just there's quite a quite a few every year and it feels like there's gonna be a matter of time until it's it's it, that's not gonna be a thing anymore that's so then you can't eat the fish that you're catching right so then you're really just killing things to kill things right. or you're poisoning you're poisoning <laughs> yourself because you're choosing to do so huh or there's like zebra mussels that eat all the right all the food for the fish and the fish will just die you guys don't have any sea lampreys do you <laughs> Do you know why I asked that? Because our son studies all of this stuff and he just picked up a book on sea lampreys and they came in through Lake Erie into Ontario. Yeah, the Great Lakes, lots of stuff coming on the barges. For, sure. <clears throat> for real, that's a thing too. And I know Superior is huge. Mm -hmm. As far as that is concerned, they're one of the main ports yeah. still of the Great Lakes. Yep. So, yay. And yeah. Minnesota also has a really cool, what is it, Great Lakes Aquarium where you can learn all this fun stuff too. I've done been there in Duluth, so, yay! Yeah, Duluth is fun. <laughs> um, so besides those two shows, what happens after you head back to Minnesota? Um, we have one more stop after those shows, and then next week we are hosting the Zirkle Pit Fest, which is like Excellent. twenty or ten to twenty bands usually, and we have a diversity <coughs> of punk to rock to hip-hop to folk and 
and we're hoping the weather's gonna be nice because we want to use the outdoor stage. <laughs> but we'll see. It's snow today, so. Just bring your coats and boots. It'll be fun. There'll be yes. fires. It'll be good. Yeah, there will be. There'll be a big fire Mutants. for sure. Um, so that kind it's of it's an outdoor festival, you know, in the woods, and it's like once again talk about nature. I feel like it's nice to get everyone out there. People can camp. Um, I used to provide some sort of free meal, some some veggie meal, and usually the other people bring stuff and. You know, it's people people welcome to stay the night. We have a big fire and it usually rages on. In the morning, there's punk rocks and pancakes. There's usually more of the acoustic folk bands that are going to play some shorter sets out there. You so, should go yeah. play this best. For all the hungover people, <laughs> there's some people. We so, should real quick learn a set and come play your show. Yeah, you bet. <coughs> Is it family friendly? Um, are children allowed? Not not at this show. We usually have some that are. Okay. And I want to... We get like a big bounce house for the kid one. This one's 18 plus just okay. because of the date it is on, which is the 20th of April. Okay. So it's kind of, it's going to be a green fest for the, for the bands as well. So. Gotcha. Do you often play with different genres of music or like when you go play other places, are you kind of pigeonholed as that's a crust band, so I have to book other crust bands? Um, or other both, bands. both honestly, you know, I like playing with the same bands because they're gonna, they're gonna like us most likely, but I love all styles of music and we tend to play a lot of diversity shows. Mm. Yeah, we, we mix it up quite a bit, I feel. There's a band from Minnesota called Runaway Ricochet that's a ska band. If you ever want to throw them into the mix of what you're doing. Yeah, we like ska. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rock City Breakfast? I've not heard them. Yeah, check them out. Ooh, Where? send us your referrals yeah, and we'll yeah. send people back. <laughs> so, yeah, we um, have kind of just started to branch into Minnesota. Apparently they know who we are, but I don't know a lot of Minnesota bands, uh, just a very small a group of them, I would say. So with that being said, who, A, that you've played with, or B, that are locals, should we know about? Give shout outs. Community, community. Uh, <laughs> Marietta, and probably I might be pronouncing that wrong, but they're really awesome. I like uh, Bracho Zinc. Bracho uh, Zinc, they're salsa band. Uh, we haven't played with Murph, but I, I really enjoy them. Uh, I mean, our, our bands in Duluth, Tony Montana, Ricky Sci Fi, Razor Tail. We like going to Grand Forks. They got a cool, Ajata Records is awesome. We like playing there. Fargo, band Seriously Hot Shit, those are our friends, Germ yeah. Circus, um, Mankato, who would that be, uh, uh God Awful, Bastards, yeah, yeah God Awful Bastards, Bastards, yeah, um, St. Cloud, Sabotov, Sama, um, Minneapolis, uh, Bubbles Rising, uh, Geiger Kellner, there's there's so much there's so many bands it's almost hard to think about them. We're playing with a lot of bands all the time. I understand that. What is the scene like? Is it easy to play and get shows, or is it difficult to try to find places to play, and bands that want to come play? Sure, I think things have changed a lot in the cities like lately. Like we've lost a lot of great venues that have been bought out. Like we've lost the Triple Rock Social Club. Big V's like a month ago. It's it's, it's changed hands. Um, there's a, a lot of good house venues too. Um, we tend to play everything and all over. I think it seems pretty easy for us to get shows. I feel like we're yeah. almost playing more often than we want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? that's that's the problem. And we maybe yeah. need to like play less shows. So I feel like it's going on all the time, but um. I think, I think there's a lot of new good venues like Pimentos New. They're yes. doing Punk Rock Thursday last Thursday of the month, so that's a new thing. And, but like Memory Lane's closed, Punk Rock Bowling on Mondays, we used to have that. And so there's been it's, it comes and goes. Venues come and go. I feel like I really want to do a show in a bowling alley. It's I a, think that would be really cool. Yeah, <laughs> some they'll put this set up the stage between the lanes, like in the middle of the place, and like 
and when people are bowling, you know, like they're bowling right. right on the side of you while you're playing. That's cool. That's pretty cool. Very neat. Yeah. Um, as far as like other humans that we've come in contact with, they've said that, you know, one of their main struggles is getting into a place because they contact the venue and the venue's like, we can't give you a shot if we don't know who you are or you have to bring in X number of people. Is that kind of similar experience that you've had or is it you just don't have a problem <laughs> with anything? <laughs> What's the most difficult part about setting up a show? Sure. Um, most of the shows we set up now is we organize a lot. Like we we'll organize all the bands, the venue, and do the flyers and stuff. So I guess it's time. I think back in the day, we had to work and talk to all the ba venues and everything. And now we probably get asked to play shows more mm. just because we've been around. Where the first couple of years, no one heard of us. And I was, you know, doing a lot more PR work and, you know, like talking to people like, hey, you should let us play here. And now I feel like it's, we played there. And if we want to play there, it's, we can ask, and it's not a big deal. You had mentioned the DIY thing, and that you do recordings and such things yourselves. Um, I think I had read on some of your social media that you do have a record label. Do you guys have a record label, or how does your music come to be available to other people? Sure. Um, I've had a record label since the mid 90s called Dilapidated Records and we're mainly uh, Midwest Trust but we do international releases. We've done a, the last one was Orphanage Named Earth. They're from Poland, uh, Records Press in Germany and then set here as multiple label and we're, we're on. My label is one of the labels that helped put that one out. He does fill without fences, and then since we've been in Radical Fun Time, we've also started Radical Fun Records, which is kind of taking the money from playing shows and investing it into our own projects, because mm -hmm. a lot of the dilapidated records I have bigger projects tied up with, and the funds aren't always there. How do you create a record label? Um, what work goes into that? Because that's something I would like to know about. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of it was putting out our own stuff and then putting out friends' stuff, and then now it's putting out some people I don't know very well, mm -hmm. but really like their stuff, and they're looking for a label or multiple labels. How did it start? I just started. It was it was like I decided that <clears throat> I wanted to do a couple cassettes and then some seven inches and. A lot of those order forms that ask you what record label it's coming out on or like a record number so like you know so you had to come up with one or whatever and, mm. and it was you know dilapidated records dr001 and just started coming out with some of the good morning records and lush workers split and how does someone get on a label like if somebody's watching who's in a band tonight can they message you and send you their stuff is there a vetting that has to be done? Do they have to pay you? Like, how does that work? Um, it happens multiple ways. Like, you can contact dilapidatedrecords at gmail.com, or actually it's dilapidatedmusic at gmail.com is what it is. And if you want to send stuff, I totally listen to it. If, if you send me stuff and I really li liked it, um, like Naked Aggression mm -hmm. or something like that, then, um, We'd probably talk about putting it out, but, um... And putting it out means what? Because we've had a lot of bands come through here that use distributors. So then they lose their publishing rights, and then, of course, they get a cut from royalties as well. What would be the benefit of trying to be on a label, and what does that look like on your end? How do you send music out? Um, well, I'll give you an example. Right now, I'm working on a Hell Bastard Split 7-inch, and... There's about 10 labels involved. Every label, choose how many copies they want and buy them. At the same time, the band gets so many copies for free from all the labels because the labels are essentially buying and putting out and then they're taking their copies and selling them. Mm -hmm. So I guess for the band, you know, if, if you're in a band, you have to come up with recording costs. 
mixing, mastering your instruments, you know, we plan to practice, you know, you have all these bills. So if someone can, you know, once you get to record, to get to the plant, we're talking thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. That's a lot for a band. So if a band could get, I don't know, 50 copies of free for the new record for, and these other labels are gonna dis distribute it for you. I guess that's what it is. You're, the bands, you don't have the cost and you're getting your release, free copies of your, of your release. Cool. It seems like just a, you know, there's so much information about how to release music. Like, what have you guys found is the best medium to do that? And do you use distributors? Do you go through, say, CD Baby or DistroKid or any of that? I, I don't. I do a lot of like trading with other labels and like, like stuff online. Um, the, the best way we actually sell stuff is probably we do a lot of live shows and sell them at the live shows and then, you know, like Extreme Records, you can get it there, Roadrunner Records, you know, a, lot, a bunch of stuff in the cities, Orange Records in Fargo, Jada in Grand Forks, Oofta Records in St. Cloud. So like when we go to these other towns Ooh. and we play the places, we usually put our, our stuff there and then you know, a few months later, we come back and play, and then we check an assignment and whatnot, so. Neat. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much to learn about doing all of this. Um, so I know that we're approaching like an hour already, so how about we talk about where folks can find you and where your music's available? Most of our stuff is on Bandcamp, which is radicalfuntime.bandcamp.com. And there's, you can buy stuff there. You can go, you can go on the merch, click on the merch section, and then mm -hmm. it actually has the physical stuff. Otherwise, you can find most of our songs are free or like don donations. If, some of the new stuff isn't, but it, most of the old stuff you can find is free on there. You're on Facebook as well. Facebook. Are you on Instagram? I'm not. No. Okay. I think we have a SoundCloud. Okay. SoundCloud. And the Reverb Nation. YouTube. YouTube. Okay. And then we're at Radical Fun Time at live.com. Very cool. And what medium is the best to attract people that you have found so far? It varies. I love vinyl. I love seven inches. That's my favorite format. So for me, that's that's why I'm at. I, that's that's what I really like. People like cassettes. So cassettes are coming back. Yes, they are. Um, I honestly feel CDs move. It's also the CDs are cheaper, you know. Putting out putting out wax is just the cost is just higher, so right. so everything costs more. So they can get you know, if it's CD, they can maybe get two CDs for the price of one record, I suppose. Mm. So what about um, other merchandise besides music? What else do you have? We got we got buttons, patches, multiple T-shirts. We got cassettes, CDs, seven inch. We have LPs. Um, he makes it. I make a lot of stuff. I mean, I drew a lot of the artworks. So a lot of the patches are, are stuff I drew, and then we printed them off. We actually had a buddy print help these print these off because the facility I was using it closed down, so I have less access to it. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing is like being around for all these years, like. You know, like we do a lot of things in the band. We I started to realize I have to start delegating some of the jobs out. Because, <laughs> you know, I was That's drawing the kids. patches, I was screen printing the patches, <laughs> and cutting them off, and then selling them. And yeah. you know, it's at the one point in time, it's like you're not maybe breaking could, child labor laws yeah. if you make those kids <laughs> press buttons. Yeah. It's a, it's an exercise. It's good work ethic. <laughs> yeah. So coming up tomorrow and then Saturday at your shows, what can people purchase from you? What you got to hack there? We got uh, new 7-inch. There's only one race, a human race. Um, Amen. Can you have, repeat that just one more time? There's only one race, a human race. We got the uh, NL War CDs. We did like a sample of like, a bunch of songs. Uh, six Years of Radicalism. Yes, we played a lot off of that one Came time. out you know, almost a year ago. No. <laughs> and then we have oh, tons of new stuff. patches. We have 12 new patch designs. 12 new patch designs? Yeah, awesome. that are hot off the press. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, 
Got some buttons and manolman. I got some wild rice for sale too. You have wild rice for sale? That's awesome. Do you like grow and sell vegetables and other like edible things too? Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I love gardening and, you know, depending on the type of year, we'll sell different things, but. That's really cool. Do you like go to farmer markets and stuff? Um, up north where I live, it's kind of a different lifestyle mentality. Ah. There's some people that will harvest wild rice for two months and that's what they'll live on all year. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that will maple syrup and there's a lot of, I actually live on the White Earth Reservation so there's a lot of natives that have kind of a different traditionalist lifestyle where they don't tend to work a steady job like everybody they else. They trade and take care of each other and like share their skill <laughs> because we're what? One race, a human race that's supposed to help each other? God damn it! Sorry. I, I actually think like wild rice is the main currency up there. Like right. if, if, you, if you have that, you could trade it for just about anything. You got a broken car, you got enough wild rice, you get a new car. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, I feel that that's what we should all eventually kind of try to strive to get to. Because we all have different talents, and if we all help each other, there's no need to be in competition. Guess what? None of us are going to win anything. We all die. Okay? <laughs> That's the moral of the story. And your history is not known until you are not here any longer. And so it's striving to be remembered as what? So that's my soapbox rant for the <laughs> evening. Thank you, Radical Fun Time, for joining us. Thank you. you can catch yeah. them in Chicago tomorrow night and then Oshkosh on Saturday. You can catch them on Facebook, Bandcamp, and SoundCloud, and YouTube, and Reverb Nation. Go buy their stuff and help continue to grow this underground music thing, as well as like peace, love, and unity, right? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us, and you can catch us next week. I believe we have Noah Green on next week. And with that... Adieu. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.